in the chat box for you to ask your questions. So we will hold all questions to the end, then go to the chat box and then take questions from the audience. We wanna give special thanks to Clark Walker and Ava Zakel for their technical assistance in bringing this to you. I now turn the program over to Larry Mansier, a member of the Older Adult Ministry Committee, who's the one that came up with the idea for this special program, and he will introduce our speaker. Well, thank you, Dr. Tom, for coming over and addressing us today. Uh, it brings me back to the day, all of a sudden we looked on TV and everything it ended as far as us going out and who was going to bring things to us. That was March 11th for us. But you must have had some inkling of things going to happen before. What kinds of preparations were you able to make before or have any plans? Take it from there to the end, because I read your letter in the, today to the parents, really good. Uh, thank you. Um, I put together a brief presentation to kind of walk you on this uh, Fine. journey. If, Fine. If you're good with that, I can start from- Fine. Uh, that's great, that's great way back when and uh, take us to the present day. I see some familiar faces. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, spending some time with me. What I want to do is give you a, a little insight into our journey. Um, and, you know, those of you who know me, I am, um, I am pretty informal. So if you have questions, uh, any, nothing's off limits. If you want to know anything about what we're doing, I'm more than happy to share it. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen. Um, I have a few slides. I'll go through a few slides. We'll take a break and answer any questions. And then we kind of will go from there if you're, if you're willing. So all right. So hopefully you can all see that. I get a thumbs up there. You see it? Great. Um, so again, thank you for inviting me. So Larry, to your point, uh, we didn't have much uh, heads no uh, much notice. Um, going back to Friday, uh, the 31st of January, I was in a meeting with the County Department of Health who said um, schools are likely to be touched by the virus at some point, um, but we really didn't know what or to what extent. Um, Obviously life fast forwarded uh, pretty quickly. And on Friday, March 13th, we moved to remote instruction at that time for only 14 days. So last March, we had to put in a plan to the state and they said, right, this is just gonna be a short-term closure, 14 days, get ready for it. Um, and then of course, you know, things unfolded more. Governor Murphy mandated that all schools had to remain closed until April um, and then he obviously changed that, and in May, we were closed for the remainder of the school year. So I will tell you, you know, for us, it was difficult. You know, we were planning in two-week increments, and then there was always this glimmer of hope that would be open by the end of the school year. Um, the state would kind of lead us on in thinking that we were going to come back, but it, it um, became more and more challenging, I think, for everybody as we were going through this. Um, one thing I will say is that we were ready. Um, E-learning or remote learning wasn't something new for us. We had been using it for several years for our first two snow days. We would do, um, students would come online and do work um, for their first two snow days each year. Um, like I said, we've been doing that since 2017. We had moved to what's called a one-to-one -one environment. Every student in grades six through 12 had a Chromebook already that they were taking home. And then students in grades kindergarten through fifth grade had Chromebooks um, in their classroom. So they were laptop computers. We actually sent them home on that Friday the 13th, ironically. Um, we sent them home with the students. A big shout out to our technology. There were a lot of kids absent on those days that over that weekend and a couple of weekends to follow, we actually hand delivered, um, myself included, um, about 250 additional Chromebooks to those people who hadn't come to school. Um, and also, you know, we're very fortunate here in Hopewell. Um, we only had about 20 families that didn't have internet access. Um, but again, we distributed, um, we bought these hotspots and we distributed them to the, to the families of the students. So the initial getting up and running, making sure everybody had a computer, um, the format we were pretty good with, um, again, thinking that it would only be about two weeks. 
Um, you know, things then change dramatically and worries happened and kind of all of our life events, um, graduation. Um, and I'll just walk you through this a little bit is, you know, what do we do for graduation? We, are, we made a graduation video for our students, um, but we also um, were able to hold an in-person graduation socially distanced in July. Um, something was really special, our seniors who really lost out uh, that year, um, they, our high school teachers visited every, every senior, went to their house, put up a sign, gave them a nice little goodie basket. Um, the, on the, you see a picture down on the right, this is the middle school, we did drive-bys for our eighth graders, teachers all came out, again, socially distanced. Fifth graders, we did that also. Um, junior and senior prom, we weren't able to do those, but we had uh, many students, they called them porch proms with their dates. It was just them and their date who they've been kind of uh, together with throughout this. Um, and unfortunately the, the plays and concerts were one of the casualties of this. Although I'll talk a little bit about what we did in September this year, we were able to address that. So then that, that got us through the, the initial part of last school year. And then we really started uh, you know, as soon as we closed and as soon as we found out, you know, we thought that this was going longer, we started planning for September. Um, so we have we had six committees with over 100 individuals involved that looked for everything from facilities to our curriculum, health and wellness, really meaning mental health and physical wellness for folks, um, operations of how we we're going to get kids back and forth to school, governance of board policy and board interaction, and then technology. What are we gonna do when those Chromebooks um, break and how are we gonna get them to students? Um, so one thing we're very proud of is we became one of only two school districts in the area that were turned in person in all grade levels on September 8th. You might have heard other districts, they um, pushed it back into later or they rolled in kindergarten you know, for two weeks and then, you know, maybe they had the high school coming back by November. We did it. We ripped off the Band-Aid and we, we brought everybody back who wanted to be back in person on September 8th. Um, we also decided to run sports. We ran sports on all levels, um, including the middle school, because we felt that that was kids needed something uh, in this crazy world in addition to athletics. And I got to give a shout out as much as I possibly can to our, our teachers. They restructured programming activities, clubs at the high school. They were running online, doing all kinds of really cool and innovative things to, to support our staff, uh, or to support our students. Um, so our challenge was we all wanted to return to a, a normal day and we can't get there. Um, so we really wanted to make a pledge to everybody that we were going to support the mental and physical health of our students and staff that we wanted to make sure there was meaningful instruction taking place, um, that we were doing more um, than just having kids log in on a daily basis. Um, cleaning was a big issue, and we'll, I'll uh, show you a little bit about what we were doing on that, and screening protocols, um, which we've been highlighted as a best practice for, and also uh, social distancing PE, PPE, um, and we didn't even know what PPE was this time last year, but uh, we're all about it now um, and making sure that all of our kids can connect. Um, and we made this pledge to our students um, and this was given to all of our students, our parents. Um, so that's kind of what I just reiterated with you, but that every student knew that we were working for them and trying to get them back as well as our staff also. Um, so we, what were our options? Our options were hybrid or remote. So the governor came in in late August and said that school districts had to provide an opportunity for families who did not want to come back to school full time, um, that they could participate remotely and that they had to um, be able to participate in all after school and extracurricular activities and all programming. So that was a little bit of a challenge, but we were able to do it. And then hybrid, um, the hybrid combines, um, you know, we have to have socially distanced, but combines students coming to school in person uh, during that time. Just to give you a numbers, I'll stop here to see uh, where you are, but these are our numbers in terms of how many people selected remote 
and how many people are with us. So for, I'll just show you the chart. And this was in January, updated in January. We have 3,416 kids in the district. Um, 1,200 are remote. So it's about 35%. Bear Tavern, you can see it, I broke it down all uh, by school. One of the challenges is um, we do have staff who are out due to medical concerns who are unable. We're fortunate that it's only about 7% in Hopewell Valley, and we've done some unique things, which I'll share uh, later, allowing them to participate um, and teach from remote locations. Um, but that was an initial uh, challenge for us to make sure that we were working through. Um, but you can see you know, breaking down Stony Brook, uh, interestingly, is almost half and half remote and in person, the high school. We've seen an uptick um, in remote learning. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, you know, re remote learning has become um, a nice, uh, it's convenient for, for some kids. Um, they don't have to get up as early. Um, and that's part of our challenges um, through that. So we had developed this plan, this four stage plan. Um, we're kind of at between two and three of our a full stage plan, you know, obviously we were remote learning last year. Um, and then we went to a hybrid and in-person with 50% capacity. And we're slowly moving towards 75% capacity with a goal to moving towards um, in-person, uh, full day, full time uh, by the end of the school year. Um, so before I go into some dig in there. I can just take a quick stop and see if anybody has any questions about kind of where we were and where we are now. I'm going to show you kind of what a day looks like um, for students of how that looks like, uh, what they're doing now and the masks that they're wearing and what an actual classroom setup looks like right now. But that's kind of our planning that got us to September. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have right now. And then I can delve back in. Nothing, anything? So, um, Tom, I'll start. Um, as you went along, going back to last school year, give us an idea of who was in on the decision-making. That is, was it central administration and principals? Was it representatives of various activities? I mean, how big was the decision-making group? Excellent question. And it, so I talked about those committees that we had, and we had over 100 people um, in the different groups. But with that was our school physician, the Department of Health, Board of Education members, Teachers Association members, um, all of those coaches, um, and kind of overseeing their own little areas in terms of our return to school. Um, but ultimately, we had one committee called governance, which was me, the president of the Board of Education, the president of the Teachers Association, um, the Department of Health, who were, okay, so we've gotten all this feedback from everybody. Now, here's where we're going to move forward. Um, and that's, that's really, that was the clearinghouse for all of that, inf the other information. Um, because, you know, we would have the report outs and our, our, you know, our coaches, our athletic director would talk about some of the challenges that they had for sports. So we'd bring that back and then we'd talk about the, you know, the, the details of that. But yeah, there were well over a hundred people involved in the discussions and the decision makings um, of all these, these moving parts with that to try to get us to move forward. And I will say, I think that's what made us, you know, whatever you want to determine success is, but that's what made us available to open um, where other districts did not because we had um, buy-in and participation from everybody as early as April of last year in terms of our planning for September. Um, let's see, uh, all sports, could there be competitive games or were there other schools not offering sports? Some schools did not offer sports. In the fall, um, with many of our sports outside, it was much easier um, and you know, middle school, was the was the I think only one other district in the area I think it was Montgomery that offered middle school uh, sports or middle they only offered a couple so our middle school team kind of did inter intramurals and did um, 
again and then played uh, Montgomery twice. Or actually, I think they might have played him four four times. Um, and then uh, the other, you know, our traditional schools that we would play in the area, um, some uh, chose not to move their team. Some games we were running constantly on games would be canceled because teams were quarantining um, because of exposure in their classes or something like that. So it was the nice thing was the kids had a place to go every afternoon. They were practicing. They had some world of normalcy and we were, were, were able to compete. We, you know, most of our football games um, and soccer games are actually our girls soccer team won the state, uh, the state conference for their region um, with that. So we were able to, to move forward with a lot of that. Now, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the screening, but not only do kids have to get screened in the morning before school started, but if they participated in sports or, or after school activities, they had to be screened again. And screening included, um, and actually I have a little one for you to see. Now we have these kiosks. You look at temperature taking kiosks where you show your face and it automatically takes your temperature. Um, and then you have to, to fill out a form that says you're not, you have not been exposed uh, to anybody. So that's, um, that's how the sports we were able, we didn't have to, we were very fortunate. We didn't have to cancel any sport, uh, sporting activity on our side. Other teams canceled, but we did not. Hi, hi, uh, Tom. I'd like yep. to ask you what kind of mask I used and uh, how do you uh, uh, keep social distancing? Sure. So if you, um, I could share that because I actually have some slides so you can see exactly uh, what we're doing. But everybody um, was given an Hopewell Valley mask. Every student was given a um you know, is approved by our physician. Every student has to wear a mask I'm with that, but I, I have some pictures if, you, if you're willing. All right, so moving on. Um, so if I could just share a little bit about wellness was very important for all of us, mental health training um, for staff, uh, socio-emotional health for our students, for our employees, you know, coming back, they had not been in school since March. And with all the media going on, it was, it was worrisome for some of our staff to come back into the building. So they had to make sure that they felt comfortable. Um, so we did a lot of that. We had our counselors. Um, one of the big things we had to deal with, particularly on the high school level, is kids who were sleeping late and trying to get them back into a routine uh, was a challenge for us. I mentioned technology, making sure that all students have a, a working device. So I'm going to walk you through a day in the life of fully remote students. Um, one thing we had to work on is that all um, remote learning is real learning. Just because they are home doesn't mean it's looser standards. They need to have the same quality and scope of education. Uh, students who are remote learning have to have access to the same curriculum. Um, so they follow the same exact schedule as our hybrid kids or our in-person in kids um, because we want to make sure that they are comfortable when they do return to to school. Um, the full remote learners, some of our teachers are also full remote. So we connect them with our um, students who are full remote. So on the elementary level, all the elementary kids have the same remote, not, um, but a teacher will have all remote students, a remote teacher will have all remote students in their class, in his or her class. Um, on the high school level, you might have six kids in your class on laptops and six kids um, at home. So that's what we call um, a real-time instructional model um, that students are doing it. Um, and remote learners are, are coming to school also at other times. So it's very, it's becoming much more flexible in what we're doing. Here's an elementary schedule. They're following the same schedule. So they, this is the schedule that they would do in the morning. Um, nine o'clock, they have reading, they have writing, they have a special, which is your music, art, um, PE or library. They have a movement break and a snack break. Then they do math and science and social studies. And here's the big thing is that this break and lunch is that students will then go home and then they log on for another 45 minutes to an hour of everyone is virtual in the afternoons um, for that. Um, here's the high schoolers. 
they follow a schedule. They get up at 7.45 a.m. If they're remote, they're online during this time. Everybody has a lunch break from 12 to 1. And then in the afternoon, they go to um, remote instruction. Everybody's online from 1 to 2.45 at the high school and middle school. Um, okay, so now this is, Gene, here's to your part. Okay, so day in the life, if you're coming to one of our schools for in-person, you have to, to go on and uh, log on to an app on your phone or on your computer, and you have to answer these three questions. All right, then, um, you know, it's, or have you experiencing any symptoms? Have you had close contact? Are you and your son house been diagnosed? We actually have expanded some of these um, now that people are getting vaccines or having uh, the tests have become more widespread. So it also includes, are you waiting results for a test? Um, then students get on a bus. Students are screened as they enter the bus. They have to sit socially distance, one student per row. Um, and then they're screened again when they, uh, when they enter the building. Um, they have to walk into the building, they have to get screened, and I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like. Let me do that right now. Okay, so this is a, a just a quick video of what a day in the life of a, a remote um, student looks like. Hopefully. So here are students getting on the bus. This is when it was a little warmer that I filmed this. Um, they come off with their masks on, buses are disinfected after each run with electrostatic spray. And this is where they come in with the masks on. They are socially distanced as they enter the building. They have to have their temperature screened first. Then they go to class and classes. This is what classes look like today. Um, hallways are one way. And passing times are expanded so that students um, are we reduce face-to-face -face, uh, interactions with kids. Um, so we talk about kids having to wear their, ma their, their correct mask. Kids have been fantastic in wearing their masks and doing what, and we also provide them mask breaks for that. Um, so I'll show you like this is what buses, you know, you get one student per seat on the bus, the temperature kiosks, takes about a second to take your temperature. You have to have your mask on. Here's what our classrooms uh, look like right now. Kids are more than six feet apart um, throughout the room with that. So, you know, what I'll do is I'll just stop there because I think I, I answered your question, Gene, but um, that that one was a big one, I think, for, for folks of just what do classrooms look like nowadays? Um, I have to say that the kids, we had big worries when we first started that our kids are going to take off their masks. Our high school kids are going to take off their masks. And is that going to be a disciplinary problem? The kids have been fantastic uh, wearing it. They walk down the halls, on, you know, one way halls. They follow all the rules. Um, they get on buses um, when they have to. And they're, they've been our, our best rule followers. And we'll talk a little bit about lessons learned, but our okay. kids have been so resilient. Uh, I have the question about what kind of masks, okay? Uh, um, um, yeah. so, um, so everybody has a dual filament mask. Um, we don't regulate the specifics. All we say is you can't wear a gaiter. Um, so they have to follow the CDC guidelines. So we, the, we provided every student with a mask, with a Hopewell Valley mask, um, with a dual filament mask, with, um, but they also have their own. Um, so, you know, kids can't wear the same mask every day, so they wash them. Um, so we do that. And then we have backups for kids who either lose them or something happens to them. We also have Under Armour masks, if you're familiar with those, the athletic masks for kids who play sports. Uh, we purchase masks, additional masks for them also. But one thing is that students cannot wear um, gaiters. They, they have to have an uh, I understand mask. those masks are surgical masks are only um, 50 to 60 percent effective. And they may give off um, uh, uh, aerosols that in, uh, infect the teachers and whatever. I mean, uh, they're not... Uh, I mean, uh, and what do you say about um, all students 
I'm reading your letter today. Uh, all students must show up on time. Um, uh, uh, whether in the, uh, uh, when the um, um, uh, 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 signed, but you mean full all students must show up in, uh, in school? Not in school, but they need to be online uh, on time. One of the things we've been uh, finding, uh, unfortunately, is, um, and if you remember back to your high school days, um, some kids are, when given the opportunity of not having to show up on time or showing up late, and they're a remote learner, there's really not too much discipline you can do if a kid's not in school. Um, and you certainly can't take their Chromebook away. So we had to really level set the expectations for them of saying, you know, this is a class. And if the class starts at, you know, 825, you need to be online and we need to see your face online. Okay. Because what was happening was kids would not show their faces. They'd turn their screens off. They, maybe they were listening. Maybe they weren't listening. We couldn't tell. Um, and the other problem we found is a lot of students, not a lot, that's not fair, um, but uh, some students were uh, doing things in addition to participating in their class, um, maybe watching a Netflix show um, yeah. on another screen that we didn't see um, or something like that. So we actually put in something called Go Guardian. So now the teachers can also see what's on their screen. Um, so that's, you know, again, new challenges that we're faced with. Um, through this craziness is that, and your kids are always smarter than we are in terms of that technology. Yes, like, uh, all, all, uh, all students must show up in person at school, okay, at the same time. But I, I have an additional question. Um, uh, why the emphasis on sports? Sports is just one example. We actually ran the play and all of our after school activities. Sports has been the, the, was a big topic of conversation for the governor, um, but we really wanted to provide kids an opportunity outside of school in addition to academics so they can kind of have as normal of a world as possible. But we have our World Health Organization Club. We have our Red Cross Club. Our play took place virtually. So our marching band took place virtually, our cheerleaders. So we tried to keep everything that we could possibly continue to run possible. Because what, you know, one of the things when it got hard, it was really easy for people to say, we're not dealing with that now. We really wanted to make sure that every kid, no matter what you were doing, whether it was robotics to football, that we were gonna sure, make sure that if you wanted to participate in something that you had an opportunity to do it under the state guidelines. So it wasn't just about sports. I didn't mean to focus that on, but it's well. Uh, you mentioned sports, 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 uh, and all the examples were sports. Okay, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sorry. Okay, but like, thank you, Tom, for that explanation. That's comprehensive. All all activities. We appreciate that. Um, is there anyone else at this time before Tom goes on who would like to ask a question? Yes, I have a question. When you social distance in the classrooms, obviously you have fewer desks. Um, is there, was there enough room for the students? Did you have enough classroom space and enough teachers to accommodate this? Right now, yes. As unless the social distancing requirements change, we won't have enough room to bring more kids back. So what we did was we moved a lot of the furniture out of the classes um, and then set up desks that were six feet apart, kind of as I showed in the example. And they were, um, they're doing okay. They're doing okay. But what we're anticipating is we'll have another round of students. We're gonna ask them to come back is that we're going to have to relocate some of our classes to larger areas. And so that's what we did, particularly on the elementary level. We have um, some classes taking place in the cafeteria, some places, uh, classes taking place in the art room or some of our larger spaces. Um, then like Tollgate, for example, is an older school and uh, the classrooms are physically smaller. Um, so even if we took out or take out a lot of the furniture, it still is a challenge to, to get all the students in there that you would want. What we also did was we, um, we hired more teachers for the spring semester 
so that we could keep our class numbers down. Um, and that's what they're where, you know, we call them pods, but they're in groups of like 10 or 12. Um, so students are set there. Um, and the teachers, right now, everybody's feeling comfortable kind of with where we are. But I know when the weather gets warm, folks are going to want to come back. So that's part of our planning for next steps that I can share. Yeah. Would you like to go on to that, Tom? Sure. Okay. Go back. So that, that was, a, again, an example of our classrooms of kind of how they're socially distanced uh, for our students. Um, schedules, as I shared there, they, we try to keep them as close to normal as possible. Um, something else you should just be aware of at this time, no lunches are served. Um, it's grab and go snacks that are available for pre-order that we give students. Um, we do have a number of students on free or reduced lunch. Um, that we need to provide that to them. We actually home deliver uh, a lot of those um, for our bus drivers. Um, something else, just so you're aware, is we do not have visitors during the school day um, for obvious reasons, but just to try to limit outside uh, groups to come in. Um, and we have security, remote view, and um, it really hasn't been an issue. And everybody's been really supportive of that, but that's, that was a worry when we first started. Um, as I mentioned, hallways, one way. Kids have been great. Stairways are one way. Um, we have extended passing time. So at the high school, you might have ninth graders go, and then a minute later, you'll have 10th graders go, and a minute later, you'll have 11th graders go. So um, not the, crowd, the hallways aren't crowded all at once. Uh, locker rooms aren't used. We aren't using lockers at this point, um, and we try to minimize moving to different classrooms to, to avoid that. Um, so Gene, to your point, uh, students are required to wear masks um, and they have to, they're all provided one cloth mask um, and students are provided um, mask breaks during the day. Um, we have a plan that's been uh, recognized by the Department of Health as best practice. You saw a little video of the electrostatic cleaners. We have those all over the place. Um, restroom use, they're cleaned regularly, restrooms and they're monitored. Hand sanitizer is everywhere. Disinfecting wipes are everywhere. Um, gloves, plexiglass panels in front of uh, teachers' desks and things like that to just really protect our staff and to protect our students. That takes place on a regular basis. Another group that's really the unsung heroes of this are our custodians who have been working incredibly hard and are you know, overall great people and just making sure that we're safe through this. Ventilation is another big area of concern. Um, is making sure that our HVAC, or our air is circulating, our air handles are filtered. We purchased um, specific hospital grade air filters for every classroom. Um, our HVAC units go on before the students come in and windows when possible are opened. Um, so that's again, trying to make it as safe as possible and make people feel comfortable. Um, we have classes outside, weather permitting. Um, Left-hand corner down is uh, a koi pond that we have at one of our schools, at the Bear Tavern School, which was uh, donated by our community. That serves as an outdoor learning space. We also rent tents um, for folks when the weather is permitted. They go outside and uh, learn outside in the fresh air. Um, as I mentioned, buses are disinfected. Um, visitors, I mentioned. Athletics, um, we talked about. Um, so next steps, just so you know where we are, we moved to five days a week programming for our elementary level. Prior to that, half of the kids came on uh, Monday, another half came on Tuesday, and they would, would flip-flop. Um, I've been meeting with our remote-only families to try to get them back. At the high school, um, the high school also has what's called two cohorts. We split our student body in half. We're collapsing those in the beginning of March. So we were preparing for more kids to come in person. Um, and then we plan to, around spring break, which is in the next month or so, move towards in-person full day for our students with special need. uh, needs. Our middle school has been doing a rolling return for students, bringing students back little by little. Um, and our goal and expectation is by the end of this year, we will be full day in person um, for any student who wants to be there, K to 12. 
Um, I recognize that there's going to be some folks who don't feel comfortable coming back and we have accommodations for them, but we're going to do everything we can to make sure that they are comfortable and supported. Um, just so I'm sure you probably may have seen this, but this is, I get the question of when are we going to come back and what are our metrics or determinators? Um, this is the area for the state. Um, we are now in moderate, we've decreased. So we're in the yellow zone in Mercer County. Um, we're in our second week of that. So that's a good sign um, for us. And this is the guide that we have by the state. So if we ever go into the red, going back here, if we go into the red, then we have to go fully remote for everybody. If we're in the orange, we kind of have to consider going fully remote. If we're in the yellow, which is where we are, um, we consider that and hopefully we will be in the low soon, um, but that's where we will push to go uh, full time, um, all people in. And that's a good, that would be a great sign for all of us to be um, in the green um, because we've been in pretty good shape. Um, Something else, just so you're aware, even during this crazy pandemic, um, we have still, um, I think we played an important role in our community by hosting forums on equity, still hosting that, LGBTQ issues. Um, we helped uh, develop and provide Hopewell Valley, uh, the mobile food pantry. Our bus drivers, when we weren't transporting students, deliver food to folks at home, um, ensuring that they, they are fed whether they're students or whether it's families in need. And we hosted the, the vaccine clinic at Hopewell Elementary um, School most recently. Um, so we're trying to do our part to support the community. Um, some lessons learned I can just share that students are amazingly resilient and far more technologically sound. I met with a parent who told me that their second grader was teaching them how to use Zoom. Um, so, you know, it's been amazing through that. Our staff have been awesome throughout this and supporting our students and incredibly creative, um, delivering instruction in ways that we never thought possible. Um, one thing we know is that schools are very flexible. It's something I think it's important to note that, you know, there's a lot of downsides to, to remote instruction because nothing replaces the in-person contact with a student and teacher. I'll be the first one to say that. But the remote learning has been positive for a lot of kids, whether kids are school phobic, whether they've had social issues in school, they enjoyed that. They've enjoyed kind of where we are. So that's something we have to learn from this also and recognize that, that we have to have a lot of takeaways from this. Um, and so we can improve education for everybody. Um, some challenges, just so you're aware of, I shared a little bit, um, and Gene, you mentioned this, we had kids that weren't showing up on time, didn't turn on their computer or cameras. Um, so we had to make a, a, a hard line in that. We had remote students where parents, they would go, they wouldn't come to school, but they would go uh, to PJ's Pancake House and zoom into the class um, while other kids were in school. And that became really disruptive. Um, People um, attending and moving cars from the dentist's office, from stores, um, that just made it more difficult for folks. To, and you've, I'm sure, all been on a Zoom call when somebody's in uh, a car, it just becomes distracting. Um, and mentioning our GoGuardian, um, I mentioned that the teachers can see what students are on when they're computer, when they're in their class. Um, and um, as I mentioned, kind of, um, jokingly, but truly that a lot of um, our issues that kids have with connectivity is because they have um, multiple tabs open or they're watching uh, some, something they shouldn't be while they're trying to be, uh, trying to be in school. Um, the final thing is I kind of uh, share is that this, the, the question or notion of learning loss, the worry about where will kids be next September? Um, so we are auditing all of our classes to see what unfinished learning has been identified, what teachers aren't covering, um, making sure that we're providing supports to kids. We're going to run a full summer program um, for students um, and for families. For those folks who don't want that, we're going to um, provide students and parents resources over the summer so they can hit their benchmarks for September. Um, I have to say, and I'll stop sharing now, that that we are incredibly lucky in Hopewell. We've really, I think, done a great job since September. Um, there's a lot of districts where we're literally sending home packets to kids. So I talked to one of our, um, our we call it advanced placement uh, AP classes, our higher level math classes. 
Um, I spoke to her this morning, actually, and she said that she's really only about a day or two behind where she typically is. Um, so the kids are getting exposed. The material is different. I mean, the exposure is different than it used to be. I mean, the you know, we just had Valentine's Day. Typically, as grandparents or parents, you might get a little Valentine that kids made in class. We've kind of cut that out to really focus on academics at this point. Um, so those kind of things um, are going by the wayside for now. And we want to get back to those because I know they're important in a, in a lot of different levels. Um, but in terms of instruction, we've done a pretty good job and I'm, I'm pleased we could always do more. But, you know, you look at some districts um, and not to speak disparaging, but, you know, some of our local districts, they just came back to in-person instruction like two weeks ago. Like we've been, and they're dealing with all those challenges right now that I talked about in committees. Like we dealt with that last August. So we are, you know, we're so far ahead of many. And unfortunately some of our, um, our inner cities, like they still haven't come back. Trenton hasn't come back. They're not coming back until May. Um, Patterson or some in Newark, their they're, kids aren't in school. Um, and our kids are and, and really receiving a top flight instruction um, as much as possible with that. Um, but we have our challenges. I mean, as I mentioned, it's not perfect by any means. We had a lot of people working on it um, and we continue to evaluate and move and, and figure things out. Um, but for the most part, um, I think we're in as best place as we could be um, for right now. But instruction has changed and we're going to change for our generation, our lifetime. The education, back to school nights are going to be different. Parent-teacher conferences are going to be different. Faculty meetings are going to be different just because you can do it like this now. Um, and, you know, one thing we heard, I think, from everybody that like parent-teacher conferences, for example, it was so convenient just to do it on Zoom rather than I have three kids, uh, you know, and I would take a half day for each kid to go for a 20 minute conference with the teacher. I'd leave here, I'd go and spend 20 minutes with the teacher and then, you know, stay home. Now you can just do it during your lunch period for 20 minutes and see the teacher. Nothing, I wanna, I, mean, I think everybody knows that, but nothing will really replace the teacher, a great teacher connecting with kids in person. Um, but it, this has provided a lot of flexibility for folks. And I've probably spoken in too much and it's great to see you, Pat. I hope you're doing well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and Pat, hopefully I didn't speak too much. I apologize. It's good to see you, you know, and it's impressive. I'm a grandma and um, I have two grandkids that I am helping with remote learning. And I'm, I am just overwhelmed and impressed with what their teachers are doing. It's incredible. That's it's, it's just totally impressive. So if you can just pass that along, my thanks. Absolutely. And the teachers have been amazing through this. And it's, um, they you know, and it's not easy, you know, on, honestly, to, to think about this. And many of us haven't, who haven't gone to stores, you know, since March, you know, I was at uh, the vaccine clinic at Hopewell Elementary. And the, the first person who came into the vaccine had not been out of our house since March. Um, so I understand that there, there is a worry for a lot of people. And then to be in a, a school of 100, 200 kids, that could be unsettling for folks, no matter how safe we make it. And our teachers have been amazing through, through all this. So thank you, Pat. I appreciate that. It's but impressive. I, Tom, speaking of teachers, there's a question in the chat box. It says, friends who are teachers in other states have been given priority for the vaccine. Is there a way to get our teachers and school staff vaccinated soon? Yes. So what you can do to help me. So if you um, actually, it was published by the Hopewell Valley News and Mercer Me. Um, I wrote a letter along with the superintendents of Mercer County, um, of which I'm president of, to the governor saying teachers need to get the vaccine now. Um, and it, this needs to be prioritized for everybody. Um, what you can do is is let the governor know um, in support. I can actually um, give a link to, to Larry or Madeline, whoever wants it, to, if you wanna just go online, cause that's, that's something we're pushing for um, more and more. I, I'm, I, I'm sure this group knows more than anybody is that 
The vaccine rollout has been disappointing at best. Um, as a school district, we have signed up to be a fixed facility, um, which means that we can um, distribute the vaccine. We have we have a school, you know, we have a school doctor um, who we pay to oversee our programs, and we have seven nurses, who all of whom can distribute the vaccine. We could knock this out in a day to all of our staff. We just need the vaccine. We have, you know, what schools do of all the stuff we do, but we do well is move people. We can move people in, we can move people out. You know, at homecoming games, we'll have 3000 people and, and they can come in and out without incident. We could do this in a heartbeat. I just need the vaccine to do it. And our nurses are willing to do it and our doctor supports it. So we've applied to get the vaccine. We're just waiting like everybody else. So I'm sorry, I was on my, uh, I was on my soapbox, I apologize. <laughs> no. no, that's that's fine. Thank you for answering that question. Um, and and that's a good segue into um, what can we and by we I mean we as individuals, we as the Pennington Presbyterian Church, and we as this broader interested community um, uh, do to help the school system. Um, one of the things we've already done that I think you'd be interested in knowing is that. Um, <clears throat> You, as you mentioned, and rightly so, you were instrumental in starting the mobile food pantry. Well, at our church, we got to talking about the fact that for older folks, I'm the one that brought it up in the first instance, I admit, climbing those steps with bags in your hands to get to the crate at the top of the steps is no mean feat and downright scary. At the same time, the young families group in our church was interested in a joint project with seniors. So what we've done now, and we're finalizing it today, is bringing those two groups together and the seniors will buy groceries and the kids' families will come and socially distance, one in the house, one outside, food out in the, on the patio, um, wearing masks and pick up the food and take it to the um, food pantry. Um, actually, the plan is to do it sort of all in one fell swoop so that then somebody's going to film it. Um, so that's something that that you started and that we are glad and I'm sure other people who, who are on this call and who are not in our church have been donating as well. But what else can we do besides write the letters that you're talking about to support vaccinating teachers? Um, is there... Are you in, um, do you foresee a, a greater need for tutors, for example? Um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it open to you. Go ahead. That's fantastic. So the two things. One is don't give up on us and come back uh, when we open. Because you, those of you who are involved in either the, the Grand Pals program or tutoring or reading to our classes, or you don't know what those are, I'll be happy to share those with you because that is such a connection that the kids are gonna need when we get back. So as soon as, whenever you feel comfortable and when we're back to whatever normal looks like is come back into the schools, we want you here. Um, and you make such a difference and we, we're so happy to see um, people in our buildings. And you don't know how much it means to kids to have even if a relative, not their necessarily a relative, but just somebody who, you know, we, we have a, and just quickly as an aside, we have, we've worked with this grand pals program yeah. where the seniors would come in and read to our students in class. And then one of our students in, in Bear Tavern sadly had lost their grandparents and adopted this, this parent. It was just such a special thing that you're know, just coming in and reading a book once a week just made a difference in a kid. And I think that's a kid's life. And I think that's something that, you know, all of this is convenient, but that face-to-face that -face human contact, I think we're going to be craving for when we get back to normal. So that's the big one. Don't, don't give up on us. And um, we'll do anything we can to make sure that you feel comfortable when you do come back in the buildings. Um, and whoever I work with to make sure that that happens, I, I will do um, if this group wants to do that. Um, the other thing is, I think, um, just, uh, I, I think connecting with your local schools, um, whether it's us or whether it's anybody is just, um, they're always looking for 
um, not, I think more support is probably the word or anything. And just, um, you know, somebody to, for a first grade class to send letters to, or to make Valentine's for, or something like that. Um, they really enjoy that. Or even zooming in, if any of you have a unique skill um, or an interesting past or a funny story, um, we are um, love to have guest stars into our classes. Um, so I, I will leave that up to you if you want to, to kind of dole it out of who, who has a, a unique story. But I think that's the other part is, the right now everybody's kind of focused on themselves and their family and i think just learning a little bit about what life is for other folks i think is going to make a big difference um for for our kids um in general um and that's again that's something that just it would take a couple of minutes of your time and our our teachers could zoom in and be happy to learn a little bit about uh life um in another time no, so for uh, day things that should wait until the fall or um, uh, like somebody listening in, uh, somebody on this call says, oh, I have, I can do such and such and I can demonstrate it. And I can do it on Zoom and they can watch me and, and then they can do it and I can watch them and whatever. Or, um, or I have a, a really remarkable story about an ancestor who did such and such. That, who should they contact? How, how do they go about following up on your suggestion? So we have a program called Help Well. It's a, and that's, and they, we can connect them through there. The best thing is if you're okay with it, if they could let you know, and then you could just let me know, and then we'll, we'll get the ball rolling uh, through that. And then we'll, we'll set it up. And that could take place, you know, not tomorrow, Saturday, but you know, next <laughs> week, um, you know, we could set that up. So that's not a, not a problem on our end. I think we're, we're looking for it. Okay. Um, and we're, like I said, we're looking for that, that interaction. And I hope that folks will take me up on reading to a, a class um, at one of our local schools because um, it, it makes a difference. It really makes a difference. You know, in a, in a way, actually this uh, distancing has brought us closer together because we have to pay attention to each other. You know, where you came in with the crowd, you went out with the crowd. Yeah. Now you keep your distance, but you see people. And everybody's learning to live with one another. Yeah, that's a good point, Larry, because you're absolutely, it's, it's, we're, what do they say, farther apart, but closer together? Yeah. Are there other questions from the group? Go ahead, if there is. Madeline, I understand I think it's wonderful that, that Tom, you're going to be in touch with Madeline about ways we can be connected, specifically the pen pal program. We are in the process of beginning at our church. And if you could let Madeline know whom to contact, perhaps specifically for pen pals. Thank you. Tom. You just tell me how many you want, because we'll get you pen pals. So okay. we could start just maybe at the Tollgate school in Pennington, or we could expand it, but I don't want to overwhelm you. We have about 250 kids per grade level, so your your mailbox might be filled. Perhaps as yeah, well, parents or grandparents writing to the children. Yep. Yeah, thank you. So Madeline yep. is contact. Madeline Thanks. has a lot of work. Sorry, Madeline. I apologize. Sure. Well, you could contact me if Madeline will talk. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> Other questions or comments, observations? Uh, only, only one thing, what about a laboratory? Like in chemistry or physics, you're not able to do that, right? It's just the so teacher we're, demonstrating? Well, for the remote students, the teachers are demonstrating for the remote students. The in-person kids are doing it. We just wipe everything down before they do it. The lab groups are smaller, um, so you do it. And what the teachers have done is kind of changed some of their, their labs that kids could do at home. Um, it was safely uh, chemicals. You know, obviously we can't send bunch of burners home to kids, but, um, but just the inside um, stuff that's safe, they've been doing. Okay. Well, it's almost two o'clock. If 
there's time for one last question if there is one. Um, not seeing any hands raised or anything. I, 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 I just like to say, uh, um, Madeline, uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, vaccine clinic, I've heard, okay, the vaccine clinic was well run at the uh, local elementary school and it was, uh, 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 just, uh, people raved about it, okay? Yeah. Good, good, good way to end, um, Gene, thank you. Thank you, Tom, so much. Yes, oh, please. please, thank you. Yeah, this has been just terrific, yay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm happy to come back anytime if you want to see what schools look like when we come back. Yes. <laughs> Very good. We may take you up on that. You okay. might have to come in person, though. You might have to okay. come to the school. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Bye.